Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank all of you for, for spending as much time as you have with us, and, and I certainly have learned a, a tremendous amount. I think where we are in some ways, at least in my head, is, is, is you all have been talking about kind of your backgrounds and where you come from and how, how you, you all kind of emerged here in your common efforts at work and a bit about what's worked and your, and your struggles to understand better what, you know, what has and hasn't worked and whatnot. And I, I'm just wondering, perhaps, if we could, if we could focus on uh, two or three things. One, one was maybe a little conversation amongst yourselves about the lessons learned, about what, what has worked and what perhaps hasn't worked. Um, and then the second part would be, what does that suggest in terms of where one goes from here? Perhaps both with the work, your project and program, but also perhaps if you would care to speculate what, what the implications are for the rest of Mississippi, for the rest of the country. How does one continue this work into this, some of these, some of, some of these new problems that we're seeing that are not just common to the urban areas, but have come to the rural areas as well? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, it, inevitably it's complicated uh, to talk about just talk about what worked. Uh, it kind of assumes that there was one fixed set of problems and one fixed set of circumstances nationally and locally and then you came in and plugged in efforts A, B, C and they worked or they didn't work. But in point of fact it seems to me there's a whole set of distinct time periods uh, during which uh, in, in a first time period is one set of problems and one set of things you did about them. But then there could come, or did come, second and third and fourth time periods when the problems were different, the national mood was different, uh, nationally and locally. Uh, the things that may have worked during the first time period weren't working as well during the second or other circumstances changed. And a continuum up to now, where some of the problems are the same as they were in 1965, and some of the problems are very different, and some of the things that you're doing are the same, and some of the things are different. In, in, uh, so there are kind of two dynamics going on at once, what was going on in all of these respects, and, and what you did about it. And I think we could be pretty clear about what the problems were in 1965, 66, up to 72 or so, and what we did and, uh, and what worked in that period and what didn't work. And I know we've talked some about uh, some of the problems along the way at that point. Uh, but that might be quite different from what the circumstances are now and what's working now. That's not necessarily what worked in, in I'm just taking a lot of words to say that what worked in 1967 or 68 isn't necessarily a formula for what's going to work now or next year or whatever. I don't know. It, it well, I think some of the things that worked in 1968, that worked in 1946, and that work, will work in 1992. For instance, one of the things, and, and it's one of the least discussed and reviewed things when we look at this period, one of the things that we know worked was the uh, exposure of local people to education and training. Uh, that is an investment in the community that, when made, works in any period. Uh, it works to uh, increase the skills and competence of the individual, but it also has a benefit to the total community in terms of what those folks do. If it's no more than what we did here of uh, moving women and men who were in cotton fields, chopping cotton for 30 cents an hour and picking cotton for two and a half cents per pound to a level of empowerment that, number one, enabled them to earn minimum wage, which given, uh, which at the time was a dollar and 25 cents an hour, and to earn minimum wage in a less um, uh, debilitating circumstances than the hot 110 degree weather of the Mississippi cotton fields. They, it enabled them to learn to do something and what they were doing contributed to the benefit and welfare and comfort of other people. 
The other thing that was a benefit from uh, taking those women out of the cotton field and exposing them to education and training um, was the impact it had on their children. These people at the Delta Health Center, through their programs, effectively, and the same thing happened with uh, Operation Head Start and some of the other programs, effectively broke that cycle of, of the cotton choppers from generation to generation to generation with nothing to look forward to but perhaps being a better cotton chopper than your mama was and your mama was a better cotton picker than your grandmother was. They broke that cycle. So that strategy, which uh, was uh, part of the Community Health Action and, and Jack's plan and with Clay Simpson working on it, uh, is a strategy that we can make work in, in these communities now. I think there were other things that uh, were done through the Environmental Health and Community Health Action Program that also are uh, uh, applicable to these awful times that we live in now. And that has to do with looking at the structures of the community and recognizing that people working together can change those structures. When these men came to town, we had no black elected officials anywhere in the state of Mississippi except in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, which is a historically all black town. You know, and within the period of a few years, uh, that possibility not just of the health center itself, but as Jack is saying, which is a continuum of social change that had begun with the civil rights movement, has seen people from this health center uh, elected as mayors of some of the cities where some of the worst health and environmental conditions existed. So I think those things that were put in place, the awareness, uh, linking up people who had the heart but didn't have the skills uh, with extra funds, outside funds, outside technical assistance to make changes is still possible. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I would uh, in some ways agree with both of you. In terms of the specific strategies, yeah, I think that's compromised. In terms of what needs to be done as a continuous process of adjusting to change, that probably is continuous, and I think it requires insight, critical judgment, and the belief that uh, change can come, and, and maybe it's the belief that change can come that is the most important. You know, if you look at what was important in the beginning, uh, uh, one it was the uh, in in terms of what worked in the Delta and uh, uh, was an effective kind of intervention. Um, uh, one was the creation of a program, the National Health Center program, and the provision of federal funding that wasn't subject to local control. Yes. Uh, so that there was a kind of freedom to operate mm -hmm. independent of local political forces, the statewide power structure other existing structures. You had the opportunity to create a brand new structure uh, that didn't exist in the political and economic and social environment before. I'm talking about a dimension entirely apart from health. It could have been about anything. It was much easier to do because it was about health. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the first thing. The second, and it's implied in, in uh, uh, the second was the ability to, through that, to attract, in effect, outside technical assistance, doctors, nurses, lab technicians, dentists, whatever, uh, and to involve uh, what professional resources did exist in the region. And that turned out to be important not only because you just weren't a foreign body then that came in from outside, you were involving the Aaron Shirley's and the Bob Smith's and others. And one of the things that happened in consequence of that is that they went off and replicated and in some respects improved. Uh, but the third thing was uh, that a commitment from the beginning was uh, uh, community organization, community empowerment, and the participation uh, of local people. And 
the educational activities that uh, that Elsie has mentioned uh, were really an offshoot of that in a way. That, I don't think that was anything that was planned in our heads when we were first putting this whole package together and uh, just grew. Well, what that meant, um, those things together, and that last part of the community participation and empowerment and the idea which uh, was always there but uh, uh, got much better expression uh, after the first five years or so, the idea that uh, the local community, uh, new social organization of some kind, the health council, would ultimately own and operate and have the capacity to manage it. What you were doing that is, to that extent, the signal here is institution building. Mm -hmm. uh, and creating what had at least a reasonable expectation of being a permanent structure. And not a self-sustaining structure in the sense that uh, this can operate on local money and local resources. It still requires a whole variety of kinds of federal and state money in addition to programs like Medicaid and Medicare and so on. Uh, but you were building an organization, you were building ideas of community empowerment and participation, you are building the skills to do it, and one hope, not very well fulfilled, is that, uh, but partially fulfilled, is that uh, the investment in people and in education would bring back the people to succeed you so that it wasn't a colonial model uh, in that sense that was always going to depend on input from outside. It's worth mentioning because I think people haven't noted this enough and I don't think anybody has studied this. Going around the country talking to health center directors and mentioning not just the education program here but the fact that there was uh, a kind of second generation effect. People got these jobs uh, and a percentage of these people uh, invested particularly in two things, a better house and sending their kids to school and high school and college. Uh, and every, t every health center director I talked to, urban or rural, uh, said, you know, uh, sometimes with a surprise recognition, that's happening at our place. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the meanings of this job. And then Elsie mentioned Head Start. Uh, one of the consequences of all of these programs that uh, gave people uh, work and status and income, but not just income alone, is that uh, uh, something happened that uh, uh, was going to have an effect on the next generation. One of the most interesting questions that I don't think anybody has looked at is what are the differences between the families, the people who chose that route and other people who didn't, uh, who, uh, on whom there was no such first or second generation effect and why did people make those choices. And John and Elsie will know better than I, there are people all around here who have sent, uh, who have three and four children with nursing degrees or MDs or law degrees or our pharmacists or whatever. Uh, one of the things I hope we can get done before we're finished is some kind of a second generation count uh, of that. So that was what was worked. Those three things I think are universals. You got to, has to be participation of the community and the idea that this is going to be a project that's ultimately owned and operated by the community. You have to invest in people and you have to uh, uh, build institutions rather than just move in projects or programs. And you have to really co continually define the problem. The problem in 1965 was uh, a different problem than, than the one for the health center than the one we we're facing in 1992. And, and that's uh, often a, a difficult thing to do is to define the problems in current terms mm -hmm. uh, so that you get a response from the community and that the investment is not in is is in a is in an issue or a problem that the community can buy into, you know, um, and that's that's the problems are much more complex than it was when it was just an absence of um, money and and what money can buy, including health care, uh, and it was very easy to identify 
who was causing that problem. They were all these white folks who had always controlled everything from the health department uh, to the bank loans to FHA mm -hmm. and everything else. It becomes much more complex when the faces at the loan center and in these places change from white to black and, and you still have the same kinds of um, control mm -hmm. and, and that makes it much, it's much easier to organize people in the community around this white man who's doing all of this stuff but when the man who has the power or the woman who has the power is black it's much more difficult to, to organize people who are suffering from the problem. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very difficult. And I think that's one of the things that have to be looked into as we plot strategies for the 21st century, the complexity of the problems. Yeah. Dr. Hatch, I wonder if you were coming back, moving into the North Bolivar County today, and going to start on your uh, kind of anthropological uh, investigations and surveys and what, what would you one would you do that today would you what would you what would you start looking for what do you think you would find I'm wondering if one way of getting it where we go is to think about how we even how we could start this thing yeah I suppose the unanswered question loudest in my mind is um, intergenerational change and I'm not sure uh, what this is. I think one of the assets, if not the most valuable one, that black people in this area had when when I was growing up and when I came back here in 65 was a fierce work, work ethic and uh, an essential decency. These were people who come in and may not have a lot of skill, but they'd give you a day's work and they'd do it with grace. Uh, because their lives had been struggle, they expected to work, and and felt it was a blessing to have a job. Mm. Now, when we look at a generation who've not had work opportunity on the farm or any place else, I'm not sure what we've got. And I, I think some of the grace that I would like to think was natural has also lessened. So I would want to start talking with young people to see their perception of life, where they think they are now, where they think they're going, because I see a lot of uh, evidence of self-destructive kinds of behaviors, and uh, I, I don't know what they see, say, when I was growing up there was a fantasy of Chicago and mm -hmm. New York and sort of the promised land syndrome. Well, I think these kids know there's no promised land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the rural village is gone. So who are they and where do they belong in this society? Yeah, it's, it's striking in some ways things are, I mean, without that dream, that without that real sense of betterment or of a possibility of betterment, that in some ways is kind of taken away more than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, was at least what had the potential to be gained in all of that. Well, that's quite true. And one of the tragedies that John predicted, um, God, 25 years ago, <laughs> we were running around screaming about a guaranteed income. You remember that? Yeah. Um, and we wanted the president to put a floor in things and guarantee people you know, well, I remember having a conversation with him, or maybe an argument. We spent a lot of time arguing those days. <laughs> having something with him that said, well, you know, if I was these white folks, and this was John talking, if I was these white folks, I would give you all this guaranteed income that you're screaming for, and I would keep you on it for 20 years until the technology and the training changed. And then I'd have you as slaves for the rest of your lives. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't possible when we was having this conversation in 67 or 68, whenever that, whenever that national debate was raging. But I have lived to see the legacy of his prediction true, not only in this county and in the adjoining counties where we work, but also in my family, a family of very poor people 
who never was on welfare until this fourth generation of children that we have now. And I've seen young women who have not bothered and not been interested in finishing school or taking advantages of any of the educational program, including a, a young niece of mine, who is really a great niece, um, whose aspirations have changed in two generations. A grandmother, who is my sister, her father, who is my nephew, who wanted work and wanted opportunity and wanted a better life for themselves to a point where she wants a HUD subsidized Section 8 house. I mean, so that the hope of, uh, of, of improvement through hard work and study, uh, which is what we were taught, mm -hmm. um, just got lost with, with, with a generation of people, and this child was born out of wedlock um, to somebody who was on welfare and who's been on welfare and, and SSI benefits and stuff all of her life. And so it was a way of life. And although she was regularly around people who worked, the atmosphere and environment that she was a part of did not value what John is talking about. I mean, work was for crazy people. Mm -hmm. you, you really learn how to make the system take care of you. And that's, a, that's to me, that is one of the more serious problems we have. There is a decline, a very visible decline in that at that ethic that he's talking about where work was valued and was valuable, where people were their work and, and they felt good about what they were doing and there was no shame in the community for not wearing a three-piece suit to work and sitting in an office. You know, they, every work, all work was valuable and, and that's, one of the, that's one of the things that I think is related very strongly to hope um, and is also related very much to or affected by the um, the national economy and, and the things that are happening in this whole nation. Uh, and it's also part of what we see with the conflict and Im images from the television that says what you ought to be and what you ought to have mm -hmm. and the available possibilities in the local community and in these villages that, that, um, that are changing. We're talking about the urbanization of the rural Mississippi Delta uh, because uh, uh, these are the same kinds of problems you talk about in New York City or Detroit or Chicago sure. in many kinds of ways. Right. And one of the things, uh, John and Elsie may have memories of this contrast, uh, one of the things I remember from the 60s is the sense of difference between the health centers and the communities we were working in at Columbia Point in Boston, this big housing project. Uh, really a model in some ways of a variety of kinds of urban problems and the difference between that and here. Uh, and what I remember thinking is that great resources here that didn't exist to the same extent there were extended family networks, uh, a, a stronger tradition of uh, mutual help and support that came out of the uh, the needs for survival uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, the fact that then it was still an agricultural people, that is, that there was an economy that really involved an awful lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, even if the involvement uh, was pretty lousy in terms of working conditions and pay and stability and all of the rest. Uh, and uh, uh, an economic resource, potentially at least, in terms of land. And you contrasted that with Columbia Point, and uh, yeah, Columbia Point was a community, um, although almost everybody that was in that housing project, when you asked them where they were from, they wouldn't say Columbia Point, they would say where they were before they came to Columbia Point, or whatever, it was a, mm. a thing to be denied in many ways, and it was in a number of respects uh, a non-community. Uh, uh, it had structure, it had uh, a different set of teenage problems, I think, than here. There was no economic resource that you could tap on very easily. And I went around, I remember for the next 15 years saying that I thought I knew something about how to solve rural problems much more than urban problems. Well, 
that gradient, that difference is very much diminished, it seems to me now, mm -hmm. uh, as compared to, mm -hmm. to uh, back then. Well, one of the things that's actually driving up here this morning, turning off of, was that Highway 61 onto, onto this road, is right there on the corner, it's about 7.30 in the morning. It was a black dude sitting on top of a uh, BMW with a beeper on his belt selling drugs to two or three other youth. And in some ways, I'm coming back to kind of some of the stuff that you talked about, for example, kind of going into these communities and trying to figure out who are the people who help one another along, who are kind of the local natural leaders. What what frightens me to some extent is some of the leaders amongst the youth are these people sitting on yes. the mm -hmm. the yes. beaver yes. on their belt selling selling drugs. I don't know how, how you tap into that system, for example, to try to do the community development work in the way that you did it. I don't know how one how one approaches that, or, or some of the stories that you talked about when you when you turned twelve or thirteen and, and, and you were interested in boys or they were interested. You're not just so how you know how well you could throw the ball, but there was this attractive thing, and you thought about Chicago and wish you had a relative there that could yeah. help you with the money so you could wear the dress and the clothes and be how does that dream get translated into this as you call it the urbanization of, of these issues or the drugs coming to the delta and status being determined by that and the television I mean you've lost locality in a sense mm -hmm. through all this and, and well, now we still have the church <coughs> and uh, although less vibrant perhaps than in times past it is the strongest institution in in black America I think in order to increase its effectiveness it's going to have to go through some changes um, I like to believe that there still is a very clear sense of right and wrong at least in the older generation that's clear and I don't think if you took a vote this morning on are drugs good for the community, <laughs> mm. uh, I think most people would, would vote that they're not. The question is, how do they somehow gain the <coughs> energy, the focus to stop these practices in their community? And I'm thinking about stopping the person who's doing it as well as the consumer of drugs. Um, I wonder in Mount Bayou, and I don't know whether there have been discussions among community people, leaders, parents, about the drug issue and things that they might do as citizens to rid this community of drugs, for an example. I, I tend to doubt that's happened. Well, I don't know that it hasn't happened. Uh, certainly through the, the um, church, um, which is I, I'm not sure that it's, that it's accurate to say that it's not as vibrant. In fact, um, I, I'm almost inclined to say that it probably is more vibrant than it was in the past because there are so many people beating a path there because it is the most stable institution in the community and because people do know we're in trouble and you're looking for some help. And when you go into some of the larger towns, um, and even in these towns, you're surprised at how many people are in church. Granted, it's mostly women and children, but they're there. The, uh, the PTA has been very active in this particular community and trying to find ways to reach out to young people and, and address the drug problem. There's a youth organization in town. There are two or three people who, um, who are working primarily. Deborah Robinson, Ms. Parker's daughter, uh, is a minister, and she and several of her group work as volunteer councils with kids every day, every week, doing things being there for them. Uh, Amos Pate has done a great job through the, uh, through the uh, PTA of trying to uh, be there for kids. Uh, we have the Delta Youth Group and all of it is about trying to address this whole issue of the false success models in the drug culture. The, the guys with the beepers and the BMWs. And to some extent you may get some of the younger kids and you do pretty well with the girls. We are not winning the war with the young men because there are few opportunities for them um, in, this, in the um, community than there are for girls. And the opportunities that are available to them have so little status, so it's a very difficult uh, situation. But the, the community institutions 
really is all we have left. And the, the process of identifying who you are and where you can go to a large extent is through that church that at some point everybody goes through, or most everybody goes through. Uh, the other groups in the community that are very strong and very influential is the sorority and, uh, and fraternity organizations. Um, they're usually real hot around campus area, but in the Delta, because there are so few social structures, they have a they have very active memberships and they're constantly involved in stuff, and they do a lot of stuff with the kids in their little little um, uh, social things. The other groups that are that are um, where people are involved in and, and and trying to define themselves and trying to make impact on the future of of these young people is the Alumni Association. <clears throat> so Dr. Dorsey, you were talking about some of the some of the local uh, institutions and entities in the Delta area that you might that, that are still there for trying to help define uh, who people are and what what they're about. The, the young people have their own organizations there. Um, many more organizations than it was uh, in 1965 uh, and certainly more than it was when I was a kid because you only had to try high wide and the, for each club and stuff, but now you have youth to youth and a lot of organizations that the school itself sponsors to try to help kids be aware of the dangers of drugs. We are sponsoring a conference this coming Saturday uh, for youth only, you know, for youth primarily that focuses on AIDS and that connection between drugs and, and HIV infection. So I think that that's there. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that all of these organizations, individually and collectively, um, are not as powerful in influencing outcomes as is Madonna, the ultimate Madonna, and the ultimate Michael Jackson, and the guy with the B, with the BMW, and yeah. then the people. That's that's the real uh, test in the community, and it's less status attached to the young kid who just won scholarships to go to college, um, and and the person who is sitting on that corner with that cool ride and the cool clothes and lots of money. And we do, we still reward uh, materialism. Well, I don't know if we should say that we reward. We still use materialism as defining people. What, what, you're not what you can do. You're not what you are. You're what you have. But, you know, I, I, I see this as a relatively new phenomenon among black people. Well, yes it is. Relatively, because yeah. say when I was growing up, uh, with very few exceptions, curve economic curve was fairly flat. There were some people that might have had basic security and others who didn't, but those were the lines. Right. And yes, it was the quality of the individual, their neighborliness, how well they raised their children, um, their regularity on the job, those kinds of things, attributes that were essentially attainable could distinguish people and it was possible as was the case with my Aunt Betty who was uh, maid mm -hmm. but also the grand, grand mistress of the lodge which mm -hmm. was a high status organization. That's right. Well today a woman who is a maid will not be the grand high mistress. status person in That's anything. Right. That's right. So uh, indeed I That's think materialism is yeah, it's it's here, and yes, we do. I agree with what you say now. See, that's a very important thing too. We ha we have the the status uh, the attainable status symbols in the community have been downgraded, uh, so that the the maid is less likely to be the uh, grand mistress of the of the um, daughters or the grand mistress of the um, grand matron of the um, harems of Jericho. Uh, the comparable part in the Eastern Star. They are the teachers, or they are the people who have status in other organizations as well. And, and for men, and money. Yeah. and money. And for men, it's even less likely uh, for you to have status in a legitimate community based organization without money. And that's why these shortcuts to quick money are so popular. I think there's. Uh, something else I'm remembering that relates to this and and uh, what this change was. I remember again in the mid 60s coming down here and starting to work and in one sense 
uh, as things get going, being surprised at how conservative people were. I mean, in a political sense, conservative. Uh, they weren't interested in anything that, uh, whether the word was used or not, that suggested uh, socialism. They believed in the system, in the American economic and leaving race and voting aside for the moment political system, and what they wanted was a piece of it. And they were prepared to do the things uh, that might get them a piece of it. And they had hope and aspirations in that respect. Uh, it contrasted to some extent, uh, again, with, with Boston or Columbia Point or Roxbury. There was less of that there. There were people there that still bought into it, but less of it. I think uh, that one of the things that's, that's happened in both urban and rural communities is that there is a much stronger belief that uh, uh, there's no way that you are uh, going to be able to make it in this system, that it doesn't have a place for you. Or another way to put it then is, uh, uh, well, you look at, uh, uh, you then look at the alternatives. I'm thinking about young men in particular, and the alternatives are drugs and drug sales, as well as the images presented by television and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, we could be sitting in Bedford-Stuyvesant and having this conversation to a considerable extent, and I never thought I would be sitting in, in the Mississippi Delta uh, and having this conversation. Uh, there was a story, you're talking about the man with the BMW, I remember a story in the New York Times a couple of years ago about Mariana, Arkansas, in the Lee County Clinic, and there was a gang from Detroit, a uh, drug dealing gang, that was coming down regularly and recruiting people. Mm -hmm. to because come they up. were from Mariana. Because they were originally from that area, that's right. Uh, and. I don't know what's happened with that and if it's made any difference. That is, if these uh, sure. migration patterns, is it the same? I mean, we used to it, comment, it's, it's made a most of the black population in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, comes from Holmes County, Mississippi, and there are yeah. these. Yeah. And so it took a while, but what's happened in those communities is starting to get translated very directly here. Well, one of the things that has happened in the community since 1965 that uh, has had a devastating uh, impact on, on the social structures is the absence of employment. Um, with, the, with the changes in um, agriculture in the Delta, which began and coincided with the, the acceleration of the civil rights movement activities, thousands of people were in a three-year period of time, out of work. We went from a high labor-intensive economy uh, that had lots of people, as John, Jack has, uh, or John has mentioned, in the cotton fields and in the cotton gins and in the oil mills and in the other uh, agriculture-related activities. I mean, you could get a job. Plus, there was a process by which the jobs had status. I mean, the man who could pick 600 pounds of cotton and leave the field at 4 o'clock, go take a shower and go see his girlfriend, was the most important person in that, in that plantation. The woman who was up at 6 o'clock with her sheets on the line, um, and they were the whitest sheets in town, had status. I mean, there were so many ways that people had status uh, in that period that has disappeared at this point. And when you look at the complete disintegration of families, of communities, of um, institutions f compared to how they used to work and compared to what functions they had and keeping everything in the community together, you realize that the one ingredient that's gone from all of these communities, whether they're um, um, agriculture communities here in the Mississippi Delta or um, some similar type work in, in um, Detroit, uh, factory work in Detroit or steel mill work in Ohio is the jobs. And while Detroit and Ohio might do something to try to bring in some other kind of industry to replace that void, to fill that void, nothing has happened here to do that. So that you have, you have, you have nothing for people to do. You have nothing for the re community to revolve around. 
And I think that's really, really been devastating on, on everything. Yeah, to just give you some sense of the numbers, the magnitude of this. Um, in 1960, I think most of the cotton was still being harvested uh, by hand. It took about seven average pickers to pick enough raw cotton to gin out to bale. It's estimating 200 pounds a day and mm -hmm. gin out to a five or 600 pound bale. Seven people for one bale. By 1963 or four, we were picking 20 bales with a machine and one man. That's right. Setting aside 140 people, and this transition occurred within a decade. That's right. Just mm -hmm. devastation. Some of the instability in families occurred at about that time when the U.S. Uh, employment Service began to recruit migrant workers mm -hmm. from this region mm -hmm. and go to Florida, get rich picking oranges or uh, potatoes in Maine or something. They went with the notion of sending back for their families. Many of these men were not literate, and they were just gone for three, four, five years sometime. They never sent for their families. And that transition from the plantation to something else led to the destabilization of a heck of a lot of family units. And many of them weren't, lit many of them weren't literate and did not come back to their families. They, they befell um, the plight of migrant workers from Texas, Mexico, and every place else. They were, they were exploited and abused because they weren't literate by the owners of those, farm, those farms or by the crew leaders who, who really were very powerful middle people in, in that area. Uh, many of them went down and worked and when the end of the year was over, they came back to families with nothing, absolutely nothing, not even money for cigarettes. I knew some of those folks. They had nothing. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I think one of the failures, of course, during that period, and many failures, was the absence of a migration policy. Because, you know, when I got to North Carolina, it was 1970, and uh, we came online or about 73 or 4 with a tobacco harvesting machine with the known displacement ratio of 16 to 20. And we knew that the people who harvested tobacco were the least well-educated with the least market mm -hmm. and, and did nothing about relocation or retraining. And the same thing occurred, of course, here. And we, we, are, we see things happening now. For instance, at least um, some people who formerly picked and chopped cotton or worked as domestics have found work with the new agriculture crop in the Mississippi Delta, catfish. catfish. And uh, there is an OSHA policy, or there are OSHA policies that uh, demand safety in the workplace, uh, that do all kinds of stuff to protect workers in that setting. They aren't enforced because the people who own the catfish plants are powerful people in the political economy, and they're just as powerful, if not more so, than were the agriculture farmer, the farmers who uh, controlled how much we were paid when we chopped and picked cotton, or how little and what conditions we lived on, waiting for those crops to, to grow and harvest. And the same thing is happening now. We know that people are um, uh, suffering accidents, a serious accident. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome is um, at epidemic levels. And we also know that if we just slow down the speed of that belt where they're chopping heads, uh, pulling injury from poultry, that we could cut the injury rate in half. But we aren't willing to do that because we're dealing with um, we're dealing with capitalism, and we're dealing with people who make significant contributions to politicians, and nobody's going to enforce that. And the real tragedy of the oppression and the absence of alternative employment is that the people who are themselves victimized by these unsafe conditions don't want you to do too much yeah. because they could lose those jobs. It's sort of a trashing of American labor, uh, I think, up and down the line. It's just that, you know, I think black people tend to be more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. they are. There's another dimension to this I was thinking about. Uh, uh, the economic dimensions, what's being talked about, is, is uh, one of the driving forces. But there's a, a corollary or a consequence, uh, I think. Uh, chopping cotton and, and picking cotton were 
communal activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a sense of community and mutual support structure that grew out of that. Mm -hmm. What I was flashing on and remembering was one day uh, when we got a call at the health center and during cotton picking season and uh, uh, everybody went out at this one opportunity to earn money and there was a young couple uh, who were married, late teenage, and had had a young child, and the child was sick. And they had gone off uh, to pick cotton. I don't think they felt they had any alternative. And somebody from that community called us and said, they're too young, and they don't really understand how sick this child is. It had been left with some relative or other. And you got to come and get them and get this child and take it to the health center because it's really seriously ill. And somebody went out, whoever was responsible for that area, and got handed from field to field by the people in the fields until they found those two people mm -hmm. and went and collected the child and uh, brought him back here. And indeed, the child was ill. And there was... There is a sense of, uh, of uh, a common activity and support and collectivity and so on in that um, that is probably stronger than the sense of uh, collectivity that comes out of working in a factory, uh, but is surely stronger than when you got no work at all and when people are uh, doing whatever they're doing now. Well, that's the other part of that's the other thing that is happening in these communities that uh, makes a difference. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about yesterday, or maybe t t earlier, t sometime or another, uh, was the community and and how it was there for you in the '60s, in the '50s, in the '40s, in the '30s, and how that's changed. Now, in the cities uh, where these guys live, they have a real easy way to see what happened with that. It, it was urban planning. Um, the planners went through and wiped out whole communities and people were displaced. Um, in the 70s it was gentrification. You were forced out and, and yuppies came in and bought all of the land and the apartments and the buildings up. In, the, in, the, in, in rural places like Shelby, Mississippi, um, where I live and where the population in 1965 was 2,200 people and it's now 28, it was low cost housing that people who had been living in traditional communities moved out of and into these new houses and they didn't they they didn't become a community i mean somebody may have moved in from mount bay and somebody may have moved in from out on the other side of round lake and somebody may have moved in from chicago but they didn't they weren't a community they they were people who lived in track housing in a development and and they may not even know each other and that's continuous. Whereas in the other communities where these people were able to know which young couple had the sick child and was able to direct the worker until they found that person and which started the whole process with enough concern that these kids didn't know enough to know that this child was sick, this baby was sick, and we got to find them all and get them to the doctor. Yeah. I mean, uh, that that is just not there. But, you know, I, I think that might simply require something different say these communities that we were talking about sort of emerged people living together in a common experience yes. over time that's right but wouldn't it be possible to go into these track communities and begin to develop some sentiments of community mm -hmm. about giving some focus and direction and and raising up the common interest in children and insecurity and things that people tend not to disagree a lot about. Oh, I agree. And I think Thank if there were some investment in building community as opposed to just building houses, mm -hmm. then you know we might be on a different kind of pathway. Yeah, I think it can. I think it's going to be much more difficult than it was 20 yep. years ago because we're less trustful of each other. Uh, I've just seen people trying to do that in my, my neighborhood about uh, coming together to get a building for a recreation center for the kids and and it's it's very difficult because people wonder what the motives are mm -hmm. and and do you really want a bunch of kids together because they'll be gang banging and so it's a lot more complex in being able to do it uh, you can do it I think you have to work hard on it and you certainly have to find something that is non-threatening to as few f 
as few as many factions of the community as you can, mm -hmm. and the com the complexity of the community really has changed. You know, I, I I don't know as this nation does much in the way of trying to look at the benefit of a, its social investment, but I, I think it's, it's it's truly clock eyed <laughs> in that. Uh, Certainly, Jack and I know at our respective universities there's a lot of research on why black men bang their index fingers and smoke or, or, or why they don't get uh, rectal exams. Okay. Those are important things, but in magnitude and level of importance, they are just insignificant in terms of the forces that are generating this social and psychological disintegration. So we'll spend literally tens of millions of dollars about relatively obscure medical mm -hmm. related issues and nothing on community building and development. Now I, I think the sentiment, the wisdom, and so forth to build communities is still present. At least, you know, all these people are not dead. And I certainly can remember here in Mount Bayou going to people like Joe Clemens mm -hmm. and Will Finch, neither one of whom were very literate for advice and guidance because they were wise men with lots of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm, I'm sure that's not all gone. You know, Will Finch is still down there, but. You sit down and talk to the man for five, ten minutes, you realize that he's not just an ordinary guy, that this is a man who's been an observer of life and somehow got a compass in terms of what the world is about that really works. And I think we have to find ways to, to nurture and develop these kinds of sentiments because it's still in my mind and yours and maybe our kids to some extent, but it certainly needs uh, nurturing and developing, and I think it's probably going to have to be done at a, a fairly macro level in order to have impact. I remember in the 70s that one of the things that became a dirty word was to talk about money, uh, foundations, government. Nobody wanted to talk about money uh, for programs, uh, problem solving. And if you look at the, um, the period starting with uh, 1961 and increasing from 1965, I guess it was when, 64, when the first um, uh, OEO money started pouring into communities to um, the 70s. It really was a period where an infusion of money was made in communities to address problems. And contrary to all of the um, negative stuff that people say about that period, the amount of money that was invested, which was relatively small on the scale of things in the United States, um, was probably some of the best used money that uh, any other period in our history. Um, as John has mentioned earlier, these women and men put those that money, and it was little bit of money. I, I, when I went to work for the health center, I made $50 a week, and God dog it, I didn't care what nobody said. I was rich. 50 whole <laughs> dollars a week. Oh, that was however much that was. That was a five-figure salary for the whole year. Um, people immediately went out and bought houses. I mean, I really, I really wish we had some money to do the study of, of all the folks who went to work for programs that use federal money. Whatever, wherever it came from, how many of those folks bought houses? Which meant that the money went into buying land, buying a house, which white contractors and black contractors and subcontractors benefited from. Then they bought furniture to go into houses, which, which somebody benefited. I mean, the money turned over and turned over and turned over, and it stayed. It is in this community, you know. And, and the other benefit, of course, was that when I talked about this cycle that Jack mentioned, is that the kids had a chance to aspire to this three-bedroom brick house. I remember this man that y'all hired to help build the houses, mm -hmm. do stuff, was very upset that these women he kept running into wanted pink toilets, pink uh, 
pink bathroom fixtures, you know. He said, they haven't had any kind. Why do they want it pink? <laughs> they got blue. But they've been saving pictures from these catalogs and from these magazines that they got from the white folks' houses. And that was their dream. And they invested in these dreams as soon as they had money. And they kept them. There are housing projects here that are 30 years old that look like they was built last year because the people were proud of them and they didn't knock out the walls and they didn't break down the their, their windows and stuff. And, and it was money well spent. You know, and of course the people came and yelled and hollered and fussed about it, but in reality all it did was freed folks from the plantation system. The people spent the money well. You can look at it in, in outcome, you know, any outcome measure you want to apply, whether you talk about the acquisition of property, how many people mm -hmm. became landowners, you know, compared to people who've been on plantations, how many people um, open up saving accounts, how many people invested in credit unions, how many people bought cars or taken places, how many people acquired telephone. We still have only 46% of the people in the Delta with telephone, but how many people acquired telephone and how many people bought newspapers and books. I mean, there are all kinds of ways you can measure how well this money was invested. That's right, that's right. And the people who sent their kids to school, where we had a high school dropout that was astronomical. I don't remember the figures. This is the figures person. But we had terrific thing because people didn't have food or didn't have clothes. And that money changed all of that. You know, it really did. People who, who, who had running water, for the first time. So you could bathe every day if you wanted to instead of twice a week. Now that seems like a very small thing, but you have no idea of, yes you do, you all do, the social impact of that. Yeah. Or having four or five dresses instead of one that you mm -hmm. washed every night. I it, it mean it was a good investment and I, I think some of the problems that have to be addressed now, and I know this is not the time when people want to hear this, has to be with an infusion of money. And the money is there. It's a matter of reordering how we spend it and what we spend it on. And it's, it's, it's not for buying uh, subsidized housing for people who don't want to work, but for providing opportunities for people to become trained, to become educated, to, to learn skills that will allow them to take care of themselves. That is still, I think, the probably the best uh, investments that communities in this country can make in continuation. Well, but, but, uh, <laughs> there's an extent to which uh, we're sitting here moaning about the good old days. No, we're talking about the future. We're well, talking about what you need to do for the future. But that's the point I want to make about this. Uh, that money turned over and did all those good things that you were talking about. But it wasn't, and, and it had ripple and multiplier effects. Right. But it wasn't essentially money that was economically generated in this community. No. And therefore, it wasn't self-sustaining. I was talking yesterday about how well the co-op did and how much and varied kinds of supports it had until we tried to get that cannery, mm -hmm. which would have represented capital acquisition and uh, the ability to generate something economically here. I was telling them all about Jolly Black Giant and all those other things that uh, we were doing at that time. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, if, if it, then you got only two choices. If it doesn't get into this kind of economic institution building mm -hmm. so that there is a, a generation of that money, then uh, uh, it's going to go cyclically because the federal money or whatever is going to stop after some period of time or diminish sharply just as it has and then you slide back into a different kind of poverty but meanwhile circumstances have changed in all the ways that we have been talking about uh, and the corollary as well is that in these circumstances if you do get the training if you do get the education if you do acquire the technical skills uh, beyond the level of working in a Baxter plant uh, or whatever, uh, then you're going to leave in order to use them mm -hmm. because there aren't the institutions here that can employ you at the level that you want and with those skills and that you can stay here. So there has been that kind of continuing drain, it seems to me, again. And uh, all we're saying is that uh, uh, the problems 
the problems in bed and the problems here are not only much more similar, but they are part of a national mm -hmm. pattern of problems, mm -hmm. and that part of it has to do with uh, this social disinvestment. Uh, and some of it, in both places, and, uh, has to do with race. I'm, you know, I sat up last night reading more of Andrew Hacker's book that I mentioned yesterday, Two Nations Separate, Hostile, and Unequal, and I only can read about 10 pages at a time because I get so depressed. Uh, but he was talking about the whole pattern of the selective employment of immigrants mm -hmm. rather than American blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just a whole series of marginalizing phenomena. And uh, uh, the only activity that, the only major economic activity I know about is. Uh, that's black is the drug trade. And even there in New York, the Hong Kong Chinese are moving in on yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. But uh, and even that's just the retail market. That's yeah. right, that's right. At the top, mm -hmm. uh, the wholesaler and distributor level is white. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that part of it has to be addressed as well. But let me turn the thing around and suppose set health center aside for a minute. Suppose you're starting now and somebody from the Fed said, okay, here is a $3 million a year budget. What would you do? There's a $3 million a year budget for something. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was health center or whatever, and you wanted to use it in the same way that we had used this program and this institution as a leverage for social change. How would you use the three million to you know, I, I do some of the same things, but probably start at an earlier age. I would want to work with kids at eight and nine, and I would want to do things, you know, like summer camp. Um, John, you were saying you would start with kids in a younger age. Yeah, because I, I think the um, conflict in culture begins at an earlier time, you know, with the advent of television and increased mobility and the things they see on the street. But I, I think that there's a lot of good judgment in people, even you know, in kids. And you talk about, I would talk about minority status, I would talk about the history of black people in the Delta and their triumph over some of this oppression. I would talk about choices. I would find ways to involve them in work. And it might be involving kids in growing tomatoes or something else that they might sell and make a little money out of. But learning to work to me at an early age, to me personally, was a powerful gift. Because it meant I, there's certain things I didn't have to do in life because if it was a job that could be done, you know, and if it, if it only took hard work and a lot of sweat, I could do it and I knew it. And that gives you a certain confidence in facing the world that you might not have if you didn't know how you were going to eat. So you could, you could teach work, you could teach choices, you could teach values. And I think political education and these things, the earlier they are started, the better your chances are of having sophistication. I was telling you of the pain I had in Shelby when I discovered that black kids, mostly teenagers, were supporting a carnival that in turn was put on by white folks to support the uh, Christian Academy. What? No, not Christian. Was it? White private academies. White private academy. <laughs> okay, well, they're Christian in North Carolina. <laughs> I think that's real interesting, and I guess this this is the uh, this is the influence of the teacher on the student across the years. If I had three million dollars, I would invest it in programs and activities with the Delta Youth Group, which is a group we funded here that doesn't have very much money, because I really think that that is the future of this region, and that you really do have to work intensely with this population uh, to overcome. All of the things we've been talking about for the last hour, um, the negative influences in the community, um, the result of, of um, changing and disintegration institutions, including family structure, the, the strong family unit that was so critical in the survival of black people across 
all kinds of holocaust uh it's just not there for these kids and we i would i would work with a few people like miss need and miss lee and reverend moore and we would work with the young people helping them understand and building uh, skills in working in all of the sectors of the community including businesses one of the things that we didn't do well in the 60s uh, and we haven't done well uh, nationally is have young people or have people be able to move into businesses um, businesses that they own and that they control you know and and that's how I would that's how I would that's what I would do um, they would be totally involved we'd build a counterculture of young people and, and try to try to get them to the point where as leaders they could go back and restore some of these lost um, institutions and values that, that are now. Well, there's two yeah. things about that. Uh, one we can come back to, that's, a, that's in a way, John was using the phrase when he and I were talking yesterday, a lost generation phenomenon in a sense. You're saying, okay, I'm going to write off or well, there's nothing much I can do effectively about this generation of teenagers or somewhat younger people who we're talking about now, I'm going to start with the kids. It's a little bit like we were saying, the problem that we see in South Africa with a whole lost generation of kids. That's Except the Delta Youth Group is not, it is, it is teenagers. Okay, it's so there's some. Yeah. The second question I was going to ask about it is, uh, I remember how concerned we were in the, the first decade that we were here about the fact that all of the black kids that did graduate from high school were on a bus the next day to Chicago the minute they had their diploma. Is that still happening? And the, the question is, John, and Elsie was touching on it, you can, you can work hard to give people a work ethic, but there has to be some that's vision right. of where they're going to work and what they're going to do that's, right. uh, that's either here or it's someplace else and gone, and then you're... You know, one would hope that the nation would begin to be informed by the things that are occurring. And I think you know, black people may be an early warning system, but this, these things we're talking about are not unique to black people. They're unique to human beings that experience these forces. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know whether the nation, but I hope so, will begin to see the greater value in preventing than in incarcerating people in herding people into increasingly non-viable communities. You know, the fact that, according to our article I recently read in uh, Demography, black people at this point in history are more segregated than we've ever been in the history of America mm. uh, as a result of a lot of changes, urban renewal, perhaps a function of school desegregation and so forth. Stratification and then stratification within the black community itself so that some communities that had very much a social class mix are now overwhelmingly poor and, and without the kind of technical they prepared leadership that is mighty important in this time. Well, what would the government do or the nation do if it became well, I, aware? Well, I, uh, I think um, this awareness is coming that uh, technology should not be superior or supreme to people. You know, and I was telling you, Jack, of my good fortune in the last six or seven years of spending a considerable amount of time in, in Europe. and coming back to Durham, North Carolina, feeling somewhat depressed because the level of living of those people at the lower third in Western Europe was so much better than the level of living in terms of education and housing and recreation than it is in Durham, North Carolina and other places in America. For the, I think for the these lower are, third? For the, for the lower third, yeah. These are decisions that we make as citizens, and I'm not sure why we have chosen the pathways that we have, but it seems to me that these problems we're talking about can't be solved 
in isolation from things that are happening within the <clears throat> broader national economy. At the same time, without that participation, we can begin a process to develop the infrastructures that would be necessary to move things forward. And I think we can always improve conditions to some degree. But in terms of solving these problems, yes, I think we, I think the nation has to react in a positive way and recognize that you can't you can't sacrifice a third of your people in terms of public goods and resources and still have a viable nation at least I don't think you can I'm more pessimistic than I, I am too and I'm much more pessimistic than believing the nation knows or cares about anything I mean cat we're driven by capitalism and alienation and I really don't think but the nation will do anything but we're going to change that